que bien, puisque ça va commencer par une série de deux conférences, on appelle ça c'est la première double conférence, et la deuxième conférence aura lieu la semaine prochaine à la même heure, à la même, à la même salle, et avec les mêmes orateurs. Alors l'orateur c'est Ken Rothman, voilà, il y a là, pas mal déjà qui l'ont rencontré, en tout cas qui l'ont au moins vu. Je vous rappelle qu'on a une chance d'avoir Kai, c'est Kai, ça tente Kai, hein, donc on a jamais Kai en allemand. Kai est un professeur allemand qui travaille aux États-Unis depuis déjà un bon moment. Alors, nous avons la chance de compter parce que sa présence ici en tant que professeur invité et qui fait son cours de sabbatique. Kai enseigne à l'Université de San José, donc vous voyez la belle photo, là, vous voyez, c'est plus beau que nos bâtiments, apparemment. Plus beau que nos bâtiments, ce n'est pas, pas très difficile, effectivement. Kai euh, est, euh, est donc professeur depuis <coughs> pas mal de temps à San José, il enseigne la programmation et surtout Kai est très actif dans les sociétés pour l'enseignement de la programmation aux États-Unis. Alors là, dans ces deux conférences, Kai va nous faire part de ses expériences et nous montrer donc les, les tendances qu'il y a actuellement pour l'enseignement de la programmation. Alors, merci Kai et à toi. Merci beaucoup. Um, je vais parler en anglais. It's, I'm funny in English. Uh, you'll enjoy it more. Um, <coughs> so I'm going to be talking about uh, the introductory course in computer science, or CS1 as uh, we call it in, in the biz. Um, and why is it different? Um, and <coughs> uh, what do we know about why is it so complicated for students? And over the last 30 years, there have been a, quite a few efforts to, to do something about some of these challenges and to teach it in a better way. And then I'll you know, distill that to some of the things that, that I tend to suggest to, to improve the situation. And um, that should take about 45 minutes, and then we'll have the rest for, for discussion. Um, so <coughs> um, CS1 is the hardest course for students um, by a good margin when one holds students uh, in the computer science curriculum and also for non-majors who have to learn programming. So um, students forever complain it's a difficult course. Um, they, uh, they're surprised how challenging it is. It's also the hardest course for professors to teach. So if you've ever taught uh, beginners, you know that teaching, say, advanced programming languages or networking is a walk in the park in comparison. Um, but CS1 is really difficult and it's often underappreciated by the administration who sometimes has the tendency of uh, whenever they hire a new person of putting them into a CS1. Um, and um, actually, I think everyone should give a warm thanks to those people who take the time and effort to teach CS1 and uh, should, should, should thank them for, for doing what really is a difficult job. So <coughs> professors have a hard time. Students fail a lot. Failure rates are very high. I have some actual data a little bit later. And uh, that doesn't usually perturb those faculty who don't teach CS1 very much. What does bother the faculty in CS2 and other courses is that often the people who pass CS1 don't seem to have learned a lot. So forever, for as long as I can remember, the CS2 instructor at San Jose State uh, would say, how come these people have passed CS1 and they can't program a simple loop? And so if you have taught CS2 or a data structures course or an algorithms course, you may have had a few of those students who passed the introductory courses and who can't program a sim simple loop. And you wonder, you know, why did they get passed? But it's happened. And it's always been like that. So this really is a tale as old as time. Um, if you look back, in, uh, for example, into this book by, that was written in 1988, you know, ages ago, by Solway and Spore, the book's called Studying the Novice Programmer, and the book is full of research papers, very interesting, that shows that students have a hard time with CS1. CS1 is the hardest course to teach. They pass CS1 and they don't know what they're doing in CS2. And in fact, <coughs> it's not just academic researchers and CS2 professors who complain about it, it is hiring managers. So this, this is a famous story that you may have seen on a, on a <coughs> blog by Jeff Atwood. That Jeff Atwood has this blog called Coding Horror. That's, that's pretty funny. And so he quotes this hiring manager who says that 
he hires a lot of people with a computer science degree, with a four-year degree in computer science, and they can't code. So he has uh, given them the absolute simplest program that he could think of that would check whether they can write a simple loop. And so this is the FizzBuzz test, and you see it here. So these are people who are hired at, at this company, and they're asked to write a program that prints the numbers in any programming language of their choice, from 1 to 100, except if, the multiple, if it's a multiple of 3, they should print Fizz, if it's a multiple of 5, they should print Buzz, and if it's a multiple of both, they should print FizzBuzz. And it turns out that about 19 out of 20 people who were interviewed could not pass this test in 10 minutes. So these are people who have a computer science degree yeah. from reasonably reputable universities. And it's not just him. So when he posted <coughs> this uh, 20 years ago, there were lots and lots of other hiring managers who said, yeah, no, you stop 10 minutes, so everybody is there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, um, <coughs> and so uh, it is scary that, uh, that this problem has persisted and persists to this day which is you know, why every company that, that hires in, in Silicon Valley has a series of tests that people have to do online or over the phone or something before they ever get invited to an interview and, and waste the time of the interview. Um, and so it's somewhat surprising. So why is it so hard? Why is it so much harder to teach kids programming than it is to teach them some, some other thing? So there's this thing that uh, in the ed uh, business is called Bloom's Taxonomy that uh, classifies the kind of skill levels that are needed for various learning tasks. So it starts out with the basics at the bottom, that you know, remembering facts, understanding them, applying them to new situations, analyzing situations, evaluating them, <coughs> and finally <coughs> creating something which is on the top of the pyramid because it relies on all the other tasks. You can't create a program if you don't remember how the for loop works. And so, oddly enough, in computer science, we start the course sequence with a course that asks students to perform on the highest level in Bloom's taxonomy because we ask them to actually create programs at the end of a one semester course. And it's very different from, say, uh, <coughs> psychology. If you look at a course intro to psychology, or what, the, what every medical student has to learn, um, <coughs> the, the introductory anatomy course, that's a course that's almost pure remembering. There's a lot of facts that you have to remember, and you have to recite them on the final exam. There may, there may be a small amount of understanding, but you don't exactly uh, apply your knowledge very much. And you certainly don't create anything in those courses. So <coughs> um, we're asking students to do something that's conceptually hard, so we shouldn't expect it to, to be all that easy. The other thing is, you may say there are other hard courses. Calculus analysis is a hard course. So why uh, aren't the calculus instructors complaining to the same degree? And there is an essential difference. If someone takes a semester of calculus and has learned nothing, it doesn't usually make a big difference to anyone, neither to the student nor to anyone in any follow-on course. Your students probably had to take calculus so that they can <coughs> go on their programming. But when they have not learned it, which I assure you most of them haven't, did it make a difference? So in computer science, it's different because we actually care that they learn to program. If they haven't learned to program, they're going to have a very hard time in the following semester. And so we're having a situation where we ask students to do something that is very hard and that actually we want them to learn. And it's a somewhat unique situation um, in, uh, in beginning courses. The other thing is that follow-on courses do often have unrealistic expectations, that the expectation is that the student is perfectly able to do advanced things after the end of the first semester and so that's something that one <coughs> that's not necessarily uh, uh, possible. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. The other thing is, of course, that students are having a hard time as being asked to do something that really is not only challenging, but it's also very different from experiences that most of them had in, in high school. So 
Alan Purvis said, this is also 30 years ago, it goes against the grain of modern education to teach students to program. What fun is there in making plans, acquiring discipline, organizing thought, devoting attention to details and learning to be self-critical? That's not something that's very popular with students. It never has been, and it probably never will be. So let me talk a little bit more about expectations that one reasonably needs to have after the first semester. So what you see here is, is a picture of Scott Riddick, a famous chess player. So he looks at this board, and <coughs> there's a very interesting fact about uh, chess players. So you can show a chess player of, of his level, uh, or so I'm told, there's research to back this up, you can show them a chess board for about a second, take it away, and ask them to recreate the position. And a master chess player can do this with perfect fidelity. They can cut up the chessboard exactly the same as they have seen it for about a second. But only if it was a chess uh, board that came from an actual game. If you show them a random chessboard where the figures are arranged completely randomly, they're no better than a novice in trying to recreate it from memory. So an expert chess player sees, <coughs> when they look at the position, they see patterns that are completely uh, invisible to a, uh, to a novice, provided they came from a realistic setup. And you know this from personal experience, when you look at a piece of code for a second or so, you probably have already figured out some part of the basic structure of it, whereas the student you know, would just start looking at public, static, void, and would just be parsing it one by one. And so this was also observed by <coughs> this paper. So, so the brackets here are some references to uh, the literature reference that are ad added at the end, if any of you want to read any of this. So 30 years ago or so, this fellow Winslow did a bunch of research on students and said, you know, which all of us know, novice programmers know the syntax and semantics of the individual statements. They know how quotas work. But they can't put them together to form valid programs. And experts don't even think about a for loop. I mean, that's something that's just a, a minor strategy. And we think in terms of algorithms and programs. And so, of course, we want our students to think about algorithms and programs. And we don't really care that they know the minor details of the sport. But it takes time. So there are some people who say that it maybe takes 10 years to become an expert in anything that's, that's worth learning. I mean, of course, you can be an expert in something stupid faster. But if it's worth learning, some people say it takes 10 years. Some people say it takes 10,000 hours. I mean, surely it must somewhat dis dis depend on the discipline. Um, so Henri Cartier-Bresson famously said, your first 10,000 photographs are your work. And it's probably the same thing with programs. The first 10,000 computer programs that you wrote are probably not your best. So, <coughs> and so many mo models that, that uh, practitioners apply change dramatically over time. The strategies that they use to solve problems, they adjust over time. And one does have to give students some amount of time. So what it does, it's not reasonable to expect that a student is going to be at the same level after a semester of study as someone who has done this for 10 years. It is, however, reasonable that they can program FISBA. So the question is, how do you get them there <coughs> um, still recognizing that they're going to have a, a good further way to go? And um, so from a pedagogical point of view is that you want to structure your set of courses in such a way that in the intro course, you get them definitely up to a level of basic competence, but you keep on re refining their programming knowledge in higher level courses. And most curriculums, including certainly yours, are designed to, to, to do that. So another interesting thing about beginning students that um, has been researched is one of the challenges that students have, they're not used to the level of rigor that is required in a programming course. And most students have a mental model that's described as partial correctness, where they generally have the attitude that it was OK for the program to work in most cases, or perhaps in many cases, or in some cases. And that it takes some amount of effort in the first few weeks to get students to understand the difference that a program you know, should really work in all cases even the, some of the more difficult and challenging ones, and it's something that's, that many students have a hard time with. Testing is generally viewed as drudgery, and uh, <coughs> you've got a 
uh, get to do some part, they have not usually been in a situation where they have to do anything with this level of precision that we ask of them in the beginning course. And so I often get students who say, well, if, if I write an English essay, you know, I can, th there's a wide latitude of what's acceptable. But in the computer programs, of course, not so. And it's something that students struggle with. And it's, tro it's troublesome <coughs> when students are overly focused, as they often are, on the grade. Because we all give partial credit for something. And so a partial credit scheme that rewards students to get to 80% by giving them 80% of credit, the behavior that you're going to reinforce is that students get the attitude that it's OK to get to that point because they'll pass the course. And it unfortunately means that um, you probably should give very little partial credit for stuff that basically doesn't work. Um, and what that means is that, it's, uh, <coughs> that you're better off checking smaller things. So for example, if one gives an assignment that uh, it asks students to produce an entire program from scratch, well, then you're going to be running just into the situation where uh, you have to give them some partial credit or they're going to hate it even more. Um, whereas if you give them smaller tasks, it's easier to grade them essentially in the binary way that you wanted to grade them, to give them full credit for something that works and just no credit or very little partial credit for something that doesn't. But it's, it's a general challenge that, that for students is just this big adjustment. Now, the biggest challenge is, of course, the, what I like to call the algorithmic chasm, where we teach the programs how a for loop works and how variables work and uh, how arrays work and all of that. And then we ask them to do things. So here is something that, that, that I did a few years ago in a lab. I had just started uh, teaching arrays. And then I, I had a lab exercise that asked students to switch all of the elements from the first half and the second half of the array. I even explained it like that. And the student's task was um, to meet up in small groups, groups of four, and write up the pseudocode for this exercise. So after 10 minutes, I uh, let, let them work at it, uh, me and my assistant. And then we walked around and looked at the pseudocode. And you know, what I kind of expected is you know, that, that, the <coughs> that they would have something that would you know, swap elements um, and you know, loop somewhere and maybe not get everything correct. What I got was um, a whole a bunch of papers, each of which essentially had one word written on it. And that word was for. All of the students had determined that a for loop surely had to be a part of the answer. And I remember what the previous slide said, that students know the syntax and semantics of the language, but they don't really know how to put it together. So I had made the mistake in the previous lecture of explaining to them in great detail how the for loop works. And they had learned that. It's not very difficult to learn. But they had no idea what to do with that knowledge and how to, you know, that was somewhere down here in the pyramid on the first level. I was up here in the sixth level. And so it was difficult for the students to, to do that. And I said, well, that may be so because they, maybe they don't know how to do the, the, the swapping, because uh, that's a little tricky, you know. And so I said, well, at least they should be able to explain to me what it is that they had in mind. Because after all, they all had agreed that they had a plan. And so I took out a bunch of coins, the coins that you, like the coins that you see here, and I lined them up on the desk of the first victim. And I said, show me. How does the algorithm work? And I expected them to start swapping the coins. Not, I think there was one group where the leader was able to do it. The others had no idea. So their strategy was to start with four and hope that out of that, a solution would, uh, would grow. Now, <coughs> And this is actually uh, not atypical. Uh, I, you know, when you look at the research, this is something that large groups of students are in, in this chasm where they just can't get any better. And you ask yourself, how do they pass the course? This question has been well researched. And the answer is, they cheat. They copy the homework from their friends and turn it in with minor modification of their own. 
they kind of do some stuff on the exam and somehow they pass the course and a certain number of students uh, finds that that strategy is good enough to progress to CS2. And that's not surprising because they're not given <coughs> the tools to really do anything else. And uh, we're generally doing a really poor job at that. I mean, I've written textbooks for many years and only recently did I start changing the way that I wrote those textbooks and add more of this algorithmic material in it. So when I look at a textbook that I wrote uh, 20 some years ago, it pretty much says here's the for loop, here's the while loop, here's the do while loop. And then I moved on to something else. And that, of course, doesn't give the students anywhere near what they need to solve any of these issues. Now they're down here, for loop, while loop, do while loop, and I want them to create something that requires you know, much more in terms of strategy. So, <coughs> um, what then the students usually get is some kind of apprentice style instruction where someone shows them how to do two or three sample problems. And my students um, always ask me, you know, just give me, give me the trick, give me the scheme, give me the formula, give me the, the pattern. And I, I have to say, well, if there was a pattern, then you and I wouldn't be in the same room because your jobs would have long been outsourced to India. And uh, so the whole point is, of course, that there is no pattern and students have to, to learn this creative act. Um, and so students generally are not given enough problems uh, to do this. Um, another problem is that there is generally in grading a very low regard for things like pseudocode. Do you give uh, uh, students credit for writing pseudocode? Most people don't because it's hard to grade. And so most students take the message and they do pseudocode. Um, like diagrams. I've so come to, and uh, uh, now whenever I have an exam, I ask students to produce a diagram in the exam and give some some amount of credit for it just so that students get their pencil out and draw something. It doesn't help that modern students are unfamiliar with the concept of a pencil. So uh, I have a lecture hall with 150 people, and who has a sheet of paper? Only the three immigrants from China in the front row. And I have to have them you know, hold it up so that everyone can see one and then acquire one for the next meeting. And <coughs> so it's not something that students are very well trained in. And so I find that I spend a lot of time on training these, these really very, very basic things with, <coughs> with beginning students. And it's getting worse. And I'm not the only one. So failure rates have been studied over the years. And so there's a general consensus that yeah, if you look at all of the classes uh, in CS1 and the known universe, you know, there's of course a lot of variation, but on average, 30% outright fails. And that has been fairly constant through the ages. Um, just about everyone who teaches a class sees what, uh, the bi uh, <coughs> this bimodal distribution where you, know, you have the ones who can get it and who will get it no matter what you and I do, the ones who definitely fail, and so this is generally called the camel head, two humps. Uh, <coughs> and so there's been an interesting research question whether one could somehow tell early on which ones are likely to fail and which ones are likely to succeed, succeed, succeed no matter what. No matter, because if you could, maybe one could put an extra effort on the people who are likely to fail, give them extra tutoring or you know, put them into a, a, a lower pace class or some such thing. Mm -hmm. And so this question has been extensively studied. Um, <coughs> and uh, the most amusing one is this paper by, uh, uh, by Benati, um, and where they claim to have found a, a test to separate out those who would pass the course from those uh, who couldn't. And so the test that they had, they said they hit upon it by accident that this was in, uh, they taught a Java class, and at the beginning of the course, they gave out a worksheet on equality testing, no, on assignment, on assignment. They gave out a worksheet on assignment, but they had a bunch of typos. And they found that the people who uh, <coughs> worked through that lab and got a consistent set of answers, even though it was the wrong answers, were the ones who would later pass the course. Whereas the ones who kind of used their intuitive feeling of what assignment might mean, they didn't pass the course uh, at, at a very high rate. So consistently applying a set of rules in their mind correlated highly with the ability to succeed in a programming course later. Um, it turns out that, that, that probably that claim was overblown and there were some uh, efforts to replicate it and they didn't succeed. But I think there was something 
because uh, this, uh, Stuart Regis has this other interesting test where he looked at about 15 years or so of exams, uh, <coughs> these are multiple choice exams at the end of the one semester course in computer science that was given nationally in the United States. And uh, there were you know, 20,000 students or so in there. And so he looked at wh which questions correlated most highly. Many questions get repeated um, so that you have equators from one year to another. So he looked at which questions correlated highly with overall success in the exam. There was one question that correlated far more highly than any other that almost, that was a pretty good predictor of whether the student would uh, pass the exam. So one would only have to give that student that one question to find out whether they were computer science. And that was this question. The question said, that <coughs> what is the result of B, set B to B not equal false? And the students who could figure this out were overwhelmingly likely to do well in the exam overall. Um, but again, it does seem a bit facile uh, to <coughs> use that. And more in the wild and regular course, other people found that the desire to pass was a stronger predictor than anything else. If you simply ask students at the beginning of the semester, do you want to pass? And they say yes. That was a good, pretty good predictor whether they were going to pass. So, and Wilson, not surprisingly, found in his other paper that I'm trying that if they already knew how to program, that was a pretty good predictor of whether they were going to pass the programming course, uh, which makes you wonder what gets, what is publishable in research. Uh, but more interestingly, if they professed an interest in gaming, they were actually going to be passing. So that surprised me because some, sometimes people say that you know, it's the gamers who, who are actually good at this, but it turns out they're not. So we don't at this point have any good way of t telling a priori who's going to do well. Another thing that bothers us in the United States is this issue <coughs> of uh, underrepresentation. Uh, I'll tell you afterwards too. Um, so, in 2012, 57% uh, of all undergraduate degrees in computer science were by women. So, well more than half. In computer <coughs> science, 18%. That's fast. So, that means that the, uh, computer science is not drawing very many women. And it's gotten a lot worse. Uh, in uh, 1985, 37% of computer science graduates and so at the time I thought, you know, maybe give it a bit of time, it'll be 50-50. But right now, it's, it's very bad. Asians are completely overrepresented. Black and Hispanics have almost no representation. So when I look at a typical lecture hall in San Jose State, it is uh, this, I might have 150 students in front of me, about 80% are Asians. And that's not uncommon. And it's something that, you know, you might say, so what? But um, it's bothersome because there are all these unfilled jobs out there, and if we're not, uh, if we're somehow discouraging large numbers of the population from even trying to get those jobs, it, it, is, it is a problem. And so there's starting to be, just now starting to be some research as to why that is so, why women avoid computer science like the plague, and, uh, or why they're just not succeeding. And so there's questions, is it, is it attitude or whatever? And to the left, you see computer engineer Barbie. Um, so the Mattel Corporation decided that they want to do their part to make computer science more attractive for a girl just by creating com uh, computer engineer Barbie. But of course, they completely messed it up. So they have a little booklet that describes how Barbie approaches computer programming. And so Barbie designs this computer game. But then the boys get to program it. And <coughs> so there is this, there is definitely an attitude, and that attitude is sadly alive and well in Silicon Valley, that if you're a girl, you're good enough for the user interface, but not necessarily for everything else. And so that's something that you know we all have to, we all have to work on. But it's something that that is that is an issue. Uh, when <coughs> it would be awfully nice to have more people in these courses who are not you know, just stereotypical. And so enrollment is something that for a while was really scary for everyone in who was teaching computer science in the United States. So if you look at the figure over here, this is the number of students enrolled in, uh, no, I should, that's wrong. It's the percentage of people who chose computer science as their major. And so you can see it goes up to like 6% or so in <coughs> uh, what was the precursor of the dot-com boom. There was a big uh, boom when PCs first came out. 
and then in the dot-com boom, everyone wanted to be in computer science, and then afterwards, it dropped by more than half. And so at the time when this happened, you know, lots of us said, gosh, they're gonna, you know, if they cut every computer science department in half, that's not so great. And maybe we need to make those courses easier and more attractive. And <coughs> uh, there were jobs definitely there um, in that uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics said there's two million unfulf uh, unfilled jobs in computer science every year. And so how come people aren't going to go, go in, into those fields? But when, <coughs> so there's 10 years or so worth of research papers on uh, interviewing students. People were very, very upset about this. And the main thing was, many students said that being a computer scientist is somehow unattractive when compared to more glamorous careers such as you know, a financial wi wi wizard or a divorce lawyer. Um, that in computer science, you know, you work long hours, you work all by yourself, and particularly women quoted that as saying that that was, you know, was incompatible with having a life balance, and it was just not a very social environment. Um, <coughs> even though it was acknowledged that it, that it paid well, but the problem with the pay was that at the time outsourcing started, and everyone knew someone who had just lost their job to outsourcing. And if you lose your job, you know, when you're 45 or so, yeah, it's not necessarily easy to, to get a new one in, in the field. And so all of this came together. The dot-com bust meant that you know, people had a bad feeling about the whole thing. And even though there were jobs, students didn't talk to them. And, but I mean, students aren't entirely irrational. The outsourcing was real. The work environment issues are real. And as Gerald Weinberg said four years ago, writing code has a place in human hierarchy or somewhere above grave robbing, but we need to manage it. And so that hasn't changed. And so, so students do have a realistic uh, sentiment. But if the news is not all bleak, this trend reversed in 2008. Because all of a sudden, being a finance wizard was no longer quite as attractive as it was before, um, since there were no jobs in finance for a few years. And so right now, there's a lot of people in the United States who are in computer science. Enrollments are way up. And the sad thing about it is that there was a real effort for a few years to make the CS1 course a better course. And much of that has just been washed away because a few years ago we had a problem. We wanted students. We wanted the students to succeed. Right now, every department has the opposite problem. They have too many students. And so the fact that a third of them fails outright is no longer the problem that it was a few years ago. But undoubtedly, the next cycle will come. And the, uh, <coughs> the opinions that we give the students now will persist at long after um, this boom is over, and so if we make computer science look unattractive and hard now, it's not going to serve us well when the next bus comes and we need those students battle. So it would be really a good idea um, to, to have a good a set of courses and not just scare a third of the students away at the, at the outset. So, <coughs> so what do we know? Um, if you want to know everything that's known about the challenges of teaching CS1, there's this paper by, by Pierce that, that goes on and on for, uh, it gives a summary of uh, <coughs> 30 years of research at least about these challenges. And it's in a nutshell what I, what I told you. And what's surprising is that there are very few things where someone uh, has found a, an intervention that actually works, done a reasonable study that you know, compares the, in, the intervention with uh, with the, the normal state and proves in a reasonably rigorous way that the intervention is successful. And uh, so there's really only three kinds of things that have been analyzed that one can say, you should really be doing these things. They have been proven to work you know, by some reasonable standard of proof in the educational community. The first one is active learning, and I'll talk about much more about this. And the second one is something that you're familiar with probably uh, Pair programming, you know, which simply means uh, you know that people work in pairs. One of them does the coding, the other one you know, assists in, in some way, or one of them does <coughs> writes down the the sort of code and the uh, discusses with the other. Um, and that's something that m many times when you know, usually when people organize labs, I don't know if you do that, but you know, we do that all the time. We have students work in pairs. Um, they 
one person who called the driver, and the other one is, is then does uh, the lab report and, and the assistant role, and then they switch the next week so that you have an uh, even <coughs> uh, even distribution of that. That's a very common thing to do these days, and it's been proven to be generally beneficial. Um, I know that it works from practical experience because if there's one thing that I hate more than this more than anything, it's uh, handicraft, bricolage. I can't do it. Neither can my dad. But when we do it together, we can actually get stuff done uh, without making the house fall apart. And because somehow we, you know, we help each other, we hate each other on, when I, why that one gets tired, the other one moves on. So there's plenty of research that that's a good thing. The other one that has actually proven to work is this thing called media computation, and I'll talk about this. So people have tried it with and tried it without, and it had a positive effect. And that's it. There's no one else who really can tell you with precision this is whether anything else is. And which is kind of sad. So if you wanted to get into computer science research, there's plenty of opportunity. And educational research, there's plenty of opportunity to do that. So one doesn't really know what motivates students. One doesn't know how to predict whether someone is going to be successful. One doesn't really know how much practice versus concepts is, is best. Um, <coughs> and I could come up with 10 other things that we don't really know. So um, most of the things that we do know, actually, we don't know from computer science, but from physics. So in physics, um, this was about 15 years ago, um, people despaired of teaching the introductory physics course. And some research showed that if at the beginning of the course you surveyed students as to what did they know about mechanics, you know, how stuff moves <coughs> around and, and what things bump against each other and what should happen afterwards, and it turns out that students come into the class with a wide array of beliefs on how the world works, most of which are wrong. And that after a semester of physics, those beliefs are largely intact. The people with the wrong ideas still have the same wrong idea. They can all do the exercises where they have to plug in numbers into an equation, but very few were able to change how they reasoned about the way the world worked. And so they, the physicists learned that the lecture somewhat didn't seem to cover. You know, physics is famous for having the professor here, 150 students, 300 students, watching the professor you know, fill up boards, the one that you see here. And so this fellow, Carl Wyman, got very upset about this. He was a Nobel uh, Prize-winning physicist. He gave introductory classes. And he started figuring out you know, what, what was wrong. And <coughs> so he said, you know, what we learned is, of course, that the lecture is dumb. That it's just not going to work. You're not going to change someone's brain by having them watch a lecture. And so what we learn, what we know is that people learn by practicing. So he set out, with, together with other people, to change the way physics is taught so that people do something actively, that students in the lecture hall have discussions with each other, that they try things out themselves, that they have the chance to make mistakes, that those mistakes get corrected. And then there is a, a good amount of uh, research that they did that showed <coughs> that this was really effective, that uh, <coughs> the students did an order of magnitude better afterwards. Um, they also worked on what's interesting, uh, these knowledge inventories where they try to find out what do students know, what, what do they need to learn, what conceptual mistakes do they have, and all of that. So they did a lot of, much better work than anyone has done in computer science, and so we're trying to learn from that. There's <coughs> another very interesting effort in the same direction. This uh, is a uh, biology professor um, who... Uh, started applying what he knew about how the brain works in, in his teaching. So there is a learning cycle that's been known to, uh, or has been described by Piaget a century ago, that says that uh, all learning goes through these stages, where you start out with some concrete experience, and you know, where you listen to something, where you see something. And the teacher has to fight a tendency of the brain. The brain has been explicitly built to throw away almost all concrete experience. Because the brain has evolved to tune itself to important events, such as a saber-toothed tiger who's just coming in through the store and is about to eat us. That's important for the brain. That I'm opening and closing my mouth here is not very important for the brain. And most people kind of shut it up. Um, <coughs> 
So the comfort experience, in order to get anywhere at all, has to then result in some kind of a reflective observation where the student then do, does something with what they listen to and what they see. And in order to get into long-term memory, which is where we kind of want it, because to teach means to change a person's brain so that they remember something a good long time afterwards, one has to get the student to formulate a hypothesis or two, to formulate something that says, well, if this is so, what does that mean? And then to test that hypothesis, preferably in a way that involves their limbs or their some kind of motion. And so there's a biological justification for that that the guy describes that says that there are pathways in the brain that actually have to do with each of these transformations. And that the only way you can get your uh, anything into long-term storage is by doing all of those things. So it actually is a very good idea for students to take notes, not because they should would ever read those notes, and as we know, students don't, but because they're forced to tell their hands what to write. They could burn the notes when they leave the lecture hall, and but that is the, the biological app that makes them remember. So that's what this guy says. It's a great book. I highly recommend it. And so it really does make you think about you know, how you want to organize your lecture. So if there's one thing that you remember from this talk, you know, in case you need to leave right now, looks like, um, it is that you should lecture less. So, and I'm not the only one who says this. Um, this is uh, from a talk that Pierre Norbert gives. Um, <coughs> he, he is one of the creators of the, of the first MOOC. Um, and so Pierre Norbert shows this picture that is stolen from one of his talks that is you know, years old or so, where you see a very typical lecture, right? Here is a head monk. Yeah, he has some kind of pointing device. Yeah. He points some stuff out to the various people. Yeah. Some of them pay rapt attention. But you see the fellow over here, the one who's fast asleep, which was 600 years ago. Right. So not much has changed when you look at what goes on in the lecture right now. <laughs> and so, <coughs> now, but when you think about it, 600 years ago, the lecture was a pretty good idea because there was no easy other way of getting information from the head monk's brain into the brain of the other people. What could he have told him? Go read a book? Books were very expensive. They were hard to make. And so go read a book was not exactly a good answer. You know, watch this YouTube movie it didn't work either at the time. So at the time, the lecture was a good answer to a problem. Today, it no longer really is. Most students have an attention span that's just been well researched between. The, the typical number is quote is 15 minutes. And that's, that's not uh, far off. When I interact with a class of 150 students, I'm not actually interacting with a class of 150 students. I'm interacting with these five here who have chosen to populate the first two rows and who are willing to engage with me in some meaningful way. And so if I'm lucky, I can actually get students to, to listen to what I say, but it's very likely that uh, one <coughs> gets beyond that. And so what one should do in class, and that's what the physicists are saying, that's what the computer science uh, practitioners are, are beginning to say, is you should lecture less. You shouldn't lecture so much. You should give the students some other kind of experience that gets them to actually remember the stuff. And that's not just in computer science, it really is, is an obvious. And so whenever anyone says this to someone who has been giving courses for a long time, the first question is, of course, how will I cover all the material? And so a friend of mine likens this to the immunization theory of uh, instruction, that you must have talked about the for loop and the while loop and the do loop so that students are now immune to it. They don't have to hear it again, ever in their life. And if you don't talk about it, then that immunity doesn't take place. Well, clearly, that's not how learning actually works, right? So. There's no sense in lecturing about stuff that the students aren't learning anyway. And if it's something basic, such as how a for loop works, there's good news. 
students can read these things, which was not necessarily the case 600 years ago in the picture. But nowadays, students can read. And so if it's something very basic, that's low value, that's basically mechanical, that's like really, really simple, like how a for loop actually works, you know, it's, it's not something that students generally struggle with, you don't have to tell them. You can tell them, read it before you come to class. And that works really well. And so this is what people do. They assign pre-class reading. They test that it's done because students being students, if you don't test it, they don't do it. And then during class, you focus on what are the higher value activities, the ones that are higher up on the pyramid. And so what one thing you can do is you can work through a sample problem. You can do the kind of sketching that you wish that the students would do. You can write up some pseudocode you know, take the time to do it. Normally, you don't have that kind of time in the lecture, but you could take the time to do that and show students that. You can do something wrong and show students how to recover from a mistake, which is not something that one usually spends a lot of time with in the lecture. So there is, uh, students in, enjoy live coding where, you know, you sit there in front of the IDE and you work things out, you make a few mistakes, you, you show the students how to tear down the problem to its simplest aspects how to write that simplest aspect, how to test it. Then they, they actually see you write a test case and it's something that, that they do. <coughs> the other thing, and that is the key to make this, this work, is that whenever you have a chance, ask the students instead of telling them. If there's anything where you can structure your course so that you can get that feedback from them, then that's great. When I was doing a, a MOOC course, a video course for, uh, for Udacity last year, that's something that they beat into me. Every time that I designed a lecture, they stop me at, uh, after minute four and say, hey, ask, don't tell. Because in that kind of course, it's very, very easy to tell the students, hey, you write a quick little program. And then they would write something. And because in, in, uh, when you do an online course, you have all the time in the world. It doesn't matter that it takes 20 minutes. And then you can come back, and then you can have a virtual discussion with them and say, hey, I bet some of you made it this way. Some of you did it that way. And at that point, they're ready to follow your discussion. In a lecture, when people come together, it's harder. Uh, and so you have to come up with shorter activities and fewer to do that kind of thing. Generally, where you have to have some kind of discussion with your neighbor. <coughs> and then what you do is how do you get feedback? There's various ways of doing it. What these kids are doing is they're having a clicker device, something that sends an IR signal to some receiver in the front. And then there's a summary of what everyone said. It's anonymous or can be anonymous, depending on how you set it up. And so then we can have a nice discussion with students that said, so many of you thought this, so many of you thought that, and let's see why someone would have thought that, and then one can you know, <coughs> uh, refine the student's knowledge a little bit more and have a follow-up session on that. And usually the students are quite excited to see that afterwards uh, that, that the curve gets better, that a good number of students do learn something. Another thing that you can do that's pretty harmless and easy to do, mix up the lecture and the lab. Instead of having a 75-minute lecture and a 75-minute lab, have a 15-minute lecture, do some lab, have another 15-minute lecture, and then also summarize what the students did. So when I do that, I walk around and see what students are doing in the labs. I look at common mistakes, and sometimes I stop the lab and give an impromptu 10-minute lecture on some difficulty that the students have. But at least that way, it gets the students to the point where they understand right away what, what their challenges are. And so that's, that's definitely recommended. Now, it's not easy. And the students are going to hate you for it at first, unless you tell them exactly why you're doing it. Because they're not used to it. In every other class, right today, you know, they're just sitting in there, opening their computer, checking their Facebook status, and having a generally easy time. Uh, and you now ask them to use their brain every t 10 minutes and you know, give you feedback and you know, look foolish in front of their peers and all of that. And so it does definitely take some adjustment. And people have found that you, know, you have to work with the students, you have to explain the benefit to them. You don't just have to do it once, but you have to do it over and over again to get buy-in from the students for it. But it is really effective. So I'm not going to have time for this. <coughs> I'll, I'll talk about that next time. But let me talk a little bit about this media computation thing and <coughs> uh, why it's big and why it's easy. So these guys at Georgia Tech were teaching uh, students who weren't necessarily CS majors, and they found, somewhat surprisingly, that not every student enjoys computing the digits of time. You know, I don't know why. There's you know, no better way of spending your time. But uh, not every student found that a cool thing. And so they decided that instead they would do everything by looking at images, 
sounds and video. So instead of having students do something, you know, do the kind of thing where you confuse, you know, how tall is the building is when you know the length of its shadow or some such thing, they would say, hey, here's an image. Look through all of the pixels and do something with them. Like here I have an example of an intricate algorithm. And they give a demo of how effective that actually is. Um, they did it in Java, but you don't have to do it in Java. You can do it in C++. Here I'm doing it in C++. So here I'm doing it with sound. And so I'm writing a program that takes a sound wave, which I'm about to play to you. So, and what I'm going to do with it is, you know what sound is? It's a, uh, some value uh, at, at every point in time. I'm first going to compute, and this is the lab that the students have to do. I've done it for you. I'm going to compute the maximum of the sound. And then for everything that's less than the max, than half of that, I'm going to set it to zero. And otherwise, I'm going to set it to the max. So when you do that, it's easy enough to see how the sound will look like. I need to run it. Do that. Uh, then you can see it looks like that, right? Which you would expect. What does it sound like? What do you think? So you have this, this scratchiness, but you do hear what it is. Right? So it's not completely lost. And so I should you can take a more interesting sample where someone is talking. You can actually hear what they're talking. And the students remember this. And later when you say, you know, what about the if statement? Remember the sound thing? That's what they will actually remember. So this is a very cool thing. And it requires nothing. You can do this in your, in your course as you have it today without making the slightest adjustment. So the other thing that is well researched is you want to remove accidental complexity. There's so much going on in your introductory programming course that you really want to remove everything that has not to do with algorithms and for basic programming. So you know, in Java, you have public static void main. If you do string handling in C, you have to worry about that you have to use stern copy and all of that stuff. Um, to, in order not to make basic errors. And there is a large number of environments, of libraries, of tools out there that are there to help the students. And you should just use them. So in, in Java, you can do without public static void main for the first half of the semester by using something like Bluetooth. And I'll show that to you um, uh, next time. Um, Eric Roberts, 20 some years ago, invented a library for doing C programming where you protect students from silliness like having to allocate memory for strings and uh, having to worry about running out of space for concatenation. You simply buy this uh, <coughs> by giving you a library for, uh, uh, that, that hides the basic details. He was, of course, criticized by some people who said, well, how come students don't know, learn how to do string copy? But he really reasonably said, that's not the role of CSS. So there's micro worlds and block languages and that, that kind of stuff. That, that are invented to give students a simplified view of the world. And they generally work fine. Practice works. So it's really effective to use an order grader, which there are more and more, and I'll show you that next time, that gives students lots and lots of little pra uh, practice exercises. And it's just like when you learn to play a piano. You don't start learning a play, uh, piano by playing uh, some large and complicated piece. You play very small things and that, that get gradually uh, that, <coughs> that get more complex gradually. And you practice a lot, and that works well with coding. There's a few things that we know that doesn't work. They actually have been well researched. There are always people who want to add more stuff to CS1. There are people who want to add UML and test-driven design and model-driven design and service-oriented architecture. I'm not making this up. There's a paper on adding service-oriented architectures to CS1. And it really doesn't work. So the paper concluded that it didn't work very well. And again, I could have told you that before, but they wanted to give it a try. You know, 
Yeah, having a lot of stuff about C pointers um, when you also try to teach the program, it's probably not going to work. And so this is not a new insight. When Bloom 30 years ago said, well, what works for example, we're teaching sophisticated material to CS1 students when study after study has shown that they don't understand basic loops. More time spent on looping problems might pay a much larger return in the long run, which is of course true. And then there's this other thing that doesn't work. And that's the last thing I'll say. And that's changing the programming language. The world is littered with papers that says, oh, we changed the language from C++ to Java, from Java to Python, from Python to Scheme, from Scheme to Turing machine code. And in the end, it makes an negligible difference. If all you do is change the language, you don't really make, <coughs> uh, make an impact. So you want to first figure out what you want to teach. And what you want to teach is you know, fundamental programming concepts and algorithms and design skills. And once you do that, you know, pick some reasonable language that makes sense for your environment. Like in your situation, you have many of your students have to later do embedded programming. So something like C++ or even base, just sticking to C, is a rational choice. Where I teach, you know, we do a lot of web programming later, and so Java was a rational choice when we last did it. And, you know, maybe we should change to JavaScript uh, at, at some point, if that's what makes sense for the environment. It doesn't really matter. <coughs> and what you want to do in CS1 is to teach the smallest possible subset of that language. You're not going to teach the whole language. Uh, uh, probably students will never learn all of C++. Um, Struscript doesn't know all of C++. And that's <coughs> it. He will cheerfully admit. And you want to then, you know, once you have a language, once you have a subset, you know, use tools and libraries to, to ease whatever minor pain there might be, um, such as this a safe STR uh, library or some such thing. All right, so that's where, where I have it. So there are five things that I want, want you to think about. Number one, there's only one thing you remember. Lecture, don't do what I just did. Don't talk for 45 minutes, yeah. <laughs> uh, <coughs> provide engaging content you know, in, in some way. You can do that with, with images, or I've seen people who had like interesting data sets. This one uh, person did uh, like a large body of emails from a criminal trial and had people look through that. It was very interesting. Uh, <coughs> simplify things. And this is CS1. It's not the role of CS1 to, to teach complicated things beyond the incredibly complicated things that you already have to teach how to get uh, the students from you know, the basic programming structure to actually creating something. And use the spiral in your curriculum design. Focus yourself on a subset in CS1 and then find some good place elsewhere for all of the stuff that you needed to cut up. So if, uh, <coughs> if there's something that right now is taught in the course because some other course depends on it, make them depend on it in another course. It's cruel and unusual punishment for the students to overload CS1. They can learn model-driven development somewhere, or C point. And finally, practice makes perfect. Give students lots more opportunity for practice than, than they have in, <coughs> in a standard lecture-driven course. They don't learn from the lecture anyway. They have to learn from somewhere. They're going to learn by practice. And what they're going to learn, frankly, is not what you would like them to learn. You would love them to learn that they are going to you know, have rational thought processes that get them to structure their program straight. That's not what they're going to get from. They want to learn to kind of model through at a much higher level of competence, though, and they will be able to do FISBUS when they're done with CS1. And that is what we should all aspire. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, I suppose the uh, question can be done in French? Uh, that's not. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so now it's time for questions. So
à la limite, ce serait bien que qu'on n'ait pas à aborder telle et telle question dans le cours tel et tel. On aimerait bien que ce soit fait en première année. Oui, ça va Alors, quel est le, le, le problème, c'est la continuité. Vous savez, dans le cours, il y a... Il y a, il y a, il y a donc, comment, euh, comment concilier d'un côté euh, l'allègement de la preuve, enfin, du CFA, avec la suite et puis les collègues Ça, c'est ma question. Donc, dans le cours, on retrouve. I'll say it in English this time. Mm -hmm. So um, you need to educate your colleagues. Because your colleagues <laughs> do not know this any of the things. More more difficult than that. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it, is, it is. Because they do not know what, what you know, that there is already too much complicated material in CS1. They do not, by and large, understand that CS1 is such a difficult course. They do not know that there have been now 50 years of research in what one can and what one cannot reasonably achieve in that course. And so yes, they will tell you, well, our students need to know, like in your particular case, they need to know pointers and the rate pointer duality and allocation and deallocation. And they do need to know that. There's no question about it that they need to know to be successful when they graduate. But they need to learn that in some other course. And so the curriculum design needs to be collegial and global and visionary enough that Someone says, yeah, here would be another course. We run into this, and so we have a course that we call computer organization, and we're not very hardware oriented, so we threw away some of the hardware stuff and actually put in some of the C coding skills into that course because it goes well with the assembly that's all supported that course. Mm -hmm. And so we found a home for that material. That may not be the right home for you. I know other universities, they require every student to take a third or fourth semester course in hard core C. I know others where they do that in the operating system flow, where they cut away a couple of the operating system algorithm parts and say, we'll just be hacking around like in a ten and half style uh, way, and that's how the students are going to get that kind of material. But you have to, you do have to kind of take some of those colleagues and say, hey, you know, give, give a look. So, so we're saying then that, that the responsibility to have at the end the well-rounded students who is capable of doing a competent job in, in complex development, that the responsibility of forming this guy is not only in this one, it but it is distributed all over different that is the That is the spiral step that you have to have. You cannot teach. It is impossible to teach everyone. You're going to fail 30% and another 30% of them have heard nothing. It's just like that. They have 50 years of research. They're telling you that. And so it simply is not a possible, it's not a reasonable thing to try to do that. And it, one does have to say, well, the curriculum is designed by the entire institution, not just by, by, by uh, a, a group of individuals. And so there has to be an overarching curriculum design. And one has to recognize that the expectation of CS1 is, you know, they can do good, but but they have to be good, and then other things have to be put in other courses. And we do that with other things. We don't expect students to know about inheritance and polymorphism in CS1. There's an object-oriented design course to do that later. And so there is an understanding with some forms on how to distribute this, this kind of work and how to make this viable work. But it, it is true that in many places, not just here, it breaks down with other forms where there's crazy pressure to put things into CS1. San Jose State is no better than anyone else. We are, for, for some reason, teaching inheritance in CS1. It makes no difference. Yeah, but it's a reflection, I think, it's a concern. Generally, if you pass on the simple iteration, it would be the best way the volume of the code of informatics in the first year. So, here, if you look at the other universities, the Metro, the CS, etc., vous allez voir que nous avons un volume d'informatique 1 et informatique 2 qui est immense, qui période. Et à, à, en plus de ça, on ajoute encore à SD1, à SD2. C'est-à-dire que les, les cours des de, 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 de bases, l'équivalent de CS1, euh, est immense chez nous. Et je ne sais pas si, justement, si en, en regardant cette taille, on a tendance à tout enseigner. On, a, on va remplir euh, 30 périodes de cours, alors on doit. On, on, a, on a 30 périodes, on peut tout enseigner, on peut tout faire. Alors je ne sais pas si ça s'est tout oublié, là, si c'est surtout ça, réfléchir, en même temps que je le dis. 
ça ne serait pas un moyen, quelque chose en tout cas qu'on devrait étudier, si ce n'est pas d'avoir des cours de base plus petits, 